So a little bit about me. As I'm the author of the upcoming book uh, called The IT Whisperer, How to Avoid Delays and Disasters in Your Project. And uh, I've interviewed about 30 people so far for this book, uh, CTOs, consultants, uh, CEOs, uh, lawyers, and recruitment agents. And based on these interviews, I have found some very interesting insights into hiring and other subjects. And I'm going to share these insights today. Uh, so this is one of the um, most interesting ones. And that's actually from an article uh, by a gentleman uh, by the name of uh, Gergi Oros. Um, he lives in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He has conducted a survey, a survey of salaries among computer engineers. Uh, now, what he found is that contrary to the popular belief, the average salary or the median salary across all salaries is not very meaningful because what he has found is that there are actually three clusters of salaries, three different kinds of companies that hire software engineers and pay different rates, so to say. So this is important to know if you're hiring anyone that you have to know in which of these three markets you actually are. Now, this, this data is from the Netherlands, but it's most likely can be generalized um, for, for all of Europe and, and probably all of the West as well. So here are the three clusters. So the highest paying ones, that's, that's actually number three here, but I'm gonna start from, from them, are the big tech. So I'm talking about companies like Facebook or Google or well-funded startups. The thing about these ones is that they pay the big buck. They offer very interesting, um, very interesting projects and they generally have a lot of candidates to choose from, although they also have a high hiring bar, so they do a lot of uh, interviewing as well. Now, at the low end, so to say, there are companies that aren't technology companies, aren't technology companies. So there are companies like retail companies or logistics or manufacturing. They also hire software engineers. Interestingly, they pay much lower rates. And what often they do is they, they think they are paying the market rates, but they really, and in a sense they are, but they are not really competing against the big tech. They're a different market. And in the middle, there's basically middle of the road companies. So companies that perhaps are technology oriented, but aren't really, don't, don't make the big bucks. Or maybe companies that aren't in technology sector, but they get it. They get it, what it takes to attract engineers. So most of the audience in here, I suspect, are going to be in category number one or two. Uh, number three is, is just really a handful of companies, but th they form, in a sense, a separate market. And here's the thing. If you want to figure out your hiring strategy, you, you need to know in which cluster you are. So you, you, have, you, have to, you have to ask yourself, are you a technology company? And, and the supportive question to ask yourself is, do you imagine your company ever selling software? Now, I, I'm going to credit that to uh, Marta Yashinska, the CTO at Bloom and Wild. Now, Bloom and, and Wild is an e-commerce company that sells flowers, but they are a technology company. Uh, so Greg is asking, isn't every company a technology company? No. So, so let me explain that. So it, with Bloom and Wild, for example, as Marta explained to me, they are building software that um, is there to sell flowers, but they imagine that the software can be repurposed to a general purpose software to, uh, that, to operate an e-commerce store with perishable products. Because that's the challenge they have there. Flowers are perishable. Some uh, things they sell, like flowers, you know, they, the flowers themselves have very uh, low, short, uh, let's say, lifespan. Whereas, for example, uh, the paper they use to, to wrap the flowers have a very long uh, lifespan, right? So <clears throat> their, their system has to take that into account. And when they are building the software, they can repurpose that in the future, excuse me, <coughs> to sell that software to other companies. So that's why they're a technology company. But a company like a retail company uh, that operates uh, brick and mortar stores, um, they could operate without technology. They could, if they could, they probably would love to not use technology at all because technology is frustrating <laughs> and expensive and, and so on. Um, sorry, so, so, so when you figure out in which cluster you are, you know where 
you have to compete. And now the thing is that the IT hiring is a needle in a haystack problem. This is an idea by David Kerr, the CEO at, at Client Server, a recruitment agency in the UK I spoke to. And he said that the outstanding engineers are hidden in a, in a large number of average ones. So these are the people who got straight A's at school without effort. So maybe they didn't even prepare for exams, right? And finding and attracting and retaining them is difficult. That's the difficult task. So how do you attract the best talent if you are not the big tech? That's the I question. Have uh, yeah, uh, Greg. So how about that? Maybe uh, let's do a, let's do a Q and A session at the end. I'm going to finish that very soon, and then, or maybe you could type in your questions in the chat, and that would uh, that would help. Sure. I mean, well. So every company is a technology company, even if you're brick and mortar. If you're not, if you're not, if you're, you're purpose-built software that handles perishable items and non-perishable items. If you're not doing it better than your competitors, and your competitors have declared themselves to be a technology company, then you lose. So every company these days is a technology company. Every company is a software company. And uh, the second thing that I'll kind of object right, right. to That's, is that, sorry, that engineers sorry. don't necessarily get straight A's in school. Yeah, I think this, these are these are interesting. They, I, I agree uh, to some extent with what you said, and I'm glad that uh, you know we can have a discussion here. But I'd I'd like to get to so to say to just what I'm saying, and um, let's go back to the discussion because I think you you made some really good points. I think I I don't disagree with you. Uh, I don't disagree with you that many engineers don't get very high grades, and I don't disagree that. Necessary. It kind of depends on how you define a technology company. Uh, I do make a distinction, but I don't think we are necessarily that far apart. Now, uh, what the point I'm making is that if you're not the big tech, you can attract with a great culture. You can attract the best with the great culture. So no matter how you define, you know, what is your best candidate, if you don't have the budget, that's basically how we can do it. And now. Um, so that's like work-life balance, friendly co-workers, autonomy, mission to identify with. Uh, um, so Anthony makes a really interesting point that he, uh, he screens candidates based on ability rather than focusing on their resume and background. I think it's a great point. I actually agree with that. Um, uh, let's, let's get, I'll get back to that in a second. So uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that companies may be repelling the best engineers. Uh, so Magda is asking, where can we access the recording of this event? So I will post it on YouTube, but I don't promise, I don't promise I'll do it right away because I have a back of things and I'm, uh, to do, and, but I would, will definitely upload it at some point. And I will send out um, uh, information on Slack where it is. Um, here's the thing. Why do talented engineers decline job offers, offers after passing all stages of the recruitment process? Now, interestingly, a lot of talented engineers do decline after they pass all the stages. And um, as someone I talked to, Adam Wickel, uh, conducted a survey. That survey was conducted in Poland, but, but I believe that this, is pro this probably can be generalized elsewhere. So half of them uh, reject the offers because, of, because they have higher comp compensation expectations. But the third reject it because of bad candidate experience. Um, so Nisa is asking, is it permitted to record from my device too? Yeah, please do so. I mean, I have no way to stop people from recording from their screen anyway. So I um, might just as well <laughs> say yes. Um, so that's a very interesting thing. That's something I didn't know. That as much, as much as a third of candidates reject the offer because of bad candidate experience. And what that means is, for example, they waited for a long time um, for information after the interview. Uh, maybe uh, they were asked the same questions over and over again, again, by different interviewers. So they felt, oh, maybe you know, these people don't communicate at the company. Maybe they were asked to do a coding exercise on a piece of paper, which is not really, you know, how you do it in, in the real world and so on. <coughs> <coughs> so uh, you have to, there are a lot of things that can make a bad impression. And, um, <coughs> Here's an interesting, interesting observation that from Aneta Kisek, another recruiter from Poland, that the most important thing is time, transparency, and honesty. Proper information to the candidate about the progress of the recruitment process, keeping your word and even honesty towards clients. If the employer cheats clients, their image is damaged in the eyes of employees 
who often resign due to that. That's what's important, not fruit Thursdays or gamification. Now, that's, that's something that really resonates with me. Uh, it seems to me that things like fruit Thursdays or gamification that is often so something that companies often introduce are not really the key attractors for engineers other than money. It's, it's, it's more about respecting the time of engineers, transparency, both you know, at, in the recruitment process and later, and honesty. I think these are, these are really key things, also in my experience. So I totally agree with that quote. And that's what I wanted to show you to you. Um, another one that I heard from another recruiter, Olaf Shoa, was that she compares recruitment to sales. She says, let's treat our candidates like we treat our clients so that we maintain a solid brand. Um, and here's another idea that I really love from, from Steve Alexander, who's an interim C CTO at a, at a confidential startup, uh, that another method to attract software engineering talent is to let them work on open source. Because when top engineers go to big tech, they often disappear from the open source community. There have been cases where somebody was active in the open source community, goes to big tech, and then they work on the closed code base. Now, there are open source projects released by big tech, but, but a lot of their code base is closed up. And that's why... Um, if, if you allow them to work on open source, if you release an open source project and, and allow your engineers to work on that, there could be other reasons to, to do that, but, but that is one of them. It can attract both engineers, and if you're in the IT sector, it can attract um, clients, possibly. Um, so a short summary. Here's basically what, what I want to say, my message. And uh, I totally appreciate, Greg, that you don't fully agree. And I love hearing this because I'm happy to you know, change that uh, and be persuaded. Uh, but here, here's what, uh, my message. So there are those three clusters of companies. And um, I believe that you need to think, consider if you're a technology company. I don't think all of them are. Now, I, we can have disagree on that, and I love that. Um, but that's, that's, that's my opinion on this. Now, if you have, a, if you're on a constrained budget, and that's most of us, you can attract with culture and open source, which is an interesting way of doing this. And the most important non-monetary attractors are respecting the time of engineers, being transparent in what you do, and being honest to them and to your clients, so that you 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 convey those values and you you convey and communicate those values through the candidate experience. So the candidate experience becomes the process by which you show that you really live those values. It's not just on your website, it says, you know, we are a, a fantastic workplace. It's the kind of ex experience that shows that. That's the idea. Um, now, Anthony has an interesting comment. A lot of companies don't have an understanding on what they need. They think they need an A-level engineer, but in, re in reality, they need they only need someone to build front and back end and connect to databases. C-level engineers suffice in this case. I think it's a very interesting <clears throat> point. And I, I actually totally agree with that. I think let's do it like this. <clears throat> uh, this is the end of this presentation. Um, we still have a few minutes left. Let's do it like this. So the next um, item on the agenda is I wanted to bring Oscar on stage because Oscar has some interesting insights. And then we'll go to Q&A and we'll talk, uh, basically we'll, uh, go back to, let's say, the view without the slides, and we'll have a discussion about it. Because I think that I actually also agree that junior engineers are sometimes underappreciated. And I think with proper management, they can do a very good job. But uh, I'd like to, I'd like to you guys to uh, listen to what Oscar says. Because Oscar, I recently met Oscar, and uh, it turned out he, he is working on a startup that seems to fit in that problem so perfectly. So I, I'm going to quit the um, sharing now um and uh yeah and let's let's go to speaker view actually um great uh, oscar why don't you introduce yourself uh and tell us a bit more about who you are and what you do awesome uh thanks for having me on and um yeah my name is oscar i am in stockholm sweden been a uh, working with IT for six months or six weeks, <laughs> years, uh, <laughs> um, three and a half of those years, the last three and a half years I've been working for a consultancy called Signy. It's uh, for the last six years, it's been voted the best place to work in Europe. 
uh, where we were 100 or so when I started, we're 200 now, but I'm uh, leaving the company now to pursue my, uh, my startup dreams. So uh, something I came to realize when I was working as a consultant, and as many of you probably know, um, at least in, in, in the type of work culture we have in Sweden, uh, consultants go through the same type of recruitment process as when you're getting recruited to a company. Um, at least in, in the type of consultancy that I do, which uh, is called something like tailored software engineer. I don't know. Um, and um, so I've been a part of a lot of recruitment processes. And um, some of our customers are big companies like um, Klarna or Spotify, uh, Mojang. Um, the, the big Swedish uh, tech companies. But then we also have a lot of smaller companies. We have um, telecom Oscar, companies. Can, yep. can, can you explain a bit more about what you do and what uh, this, this story of how it uh, took you there? Because I think that was very interesting. Yeah. yeah, so what I was getting to is uh, I've been in a lot of recruitment processes. And in a lot of time, when it, when it comes to me choosing between a, a because usually that's what happens when I'm looking for a new assignment is I have a bunch of different uh, assignments lined up that I can basically pick and choose from. Uh, and you, normally what decides whether or not I take a specific job after going through their whole process um, is uh, the, the experience that I have during the, the interview process. Um, so sometimes it's very engaging, very attracting uh, for me. Um, and sometimes it's very boring or feels very non, not personal and, and, and that makes a big difference. So what I found was a lot of companies, because when I started working at, at these places, they also involved me in their recruiting. And what I found is uh, a lot of companies struggle with trying to figure out how to attract good talent because they look at the big companies and they try to do what they're doing, but that doesn't work because they get hundreds of applications for free because of their branding. Um, but these companies can't do that, so they have to adapt. And that's where a lot of companies uh, struggle. So that's where we're looking So, so what do you do? How do you help them? What do you do as a startup then? Yeah, so we don't have a product right now, but what, what we're prototyping um, right now is, um, first of all, helping out with figuring out what do you actually need right now? Like, what are you actually recruiting for? Or what should you be recruiting for, rather than just put out the backend developer ad with, you know, here are the here's the stuff you need to know, uh, but actually figure out before you start who are you looking for, so that you have something to measure against as you go along. Um, and after that part, we help out with how to actually perform the whole uh, the whole process of interviewing someone and trying to figure out who to pick out of these people, and also how to keep these people interested while they're in your process. Uh, because a lot of people drop out during the process, like me, when I had multiple choices, I would, I would wait until I finished all the processes and then I'd pick whichever one was the most interesting. So how do you, how do you become that company that someone like me would pick? Yeah, got it. Um, so, so basically you were helping them with, with candidate experience. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's a great idea. I, think I just wanted to, uh, bring you on the stage because this is this is such a, a great way to um, attract uh, good talent when, when you don't have the budget. I think you, you're spot on with the problem. Uh, when I talk to different people in um, in re the recruitment space, that's exactly what what they were complaining about. That that candidate experience is what. Uh, repels candidates. So um, do you have any, any last uh, thoughts, Oscar, um, some comments or advice, and we'll go to Q&A? Uh, no, I, I, I like to keep it pretty broad. So uh, feel free to ask me anything, maybe right in the chat, if you have a specific question for me to answer or something. Uh, I'd love to just help out as much as I can. Great. Thanks, Oscar. Greg, I'd like to go back to you because I think you had a lot of things to say. And I think this is, this is a good moment to, if you could just unmute yourself and maybe um, just just say again what you said back there during the uh, presentation and maybe um, uh, basically let, let us know how how we can uh, recruit better. Uh, okay, well, I said two things, I'll say three. Um, the first is that every company is a technology company in these days. Um, 
whether you know whether you're operating a garage or selling flowers or whatever um, you've got a competitor out there if you don't leverage technology they're going to, your competitor is going to leverage technology before you do so um, whether you think you're in technology or you're not the success of your business in the 21st century is going to depend on technology uh, second is um, and I actually take issue with this is, is that engineers take are the people who get straight A's in school um, I'm a journalism major I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, and I got accepted to Purdue University as a chemical engineering major. Um, definitely not a straight A student. Uh, a lot of days I hardly considered myself to be an engineer, to be honest. But um, I've been doing this for 26 years, so apparently I don't suck at it too bad. Um, and I really don't look for people who necessarily got, you know, I'm not going to hold it on against somebody that they went to the right university, that they majored in the right field. Uh, that they got the right, and certainly I can look at their grades, I don't care, right? Um, some of the people that I hire are, are junior level people, and some of the people that I hire are career changers who end up being tremendous seniors. Um, and, and to your uh, uh, point about culture, um, I think one of the biggest things uh, that you can sell regarding your company's culture is committing to um, a culture of, of learning um, and a culture of, I guess, ownership. So um, where I work, we like to you know, tell all of our candidates up front that we expect them to be constantly learning and we, and we foster that and we offer people as many opportunities as they possibly can get uh, to continue improving themselves and to learn new things. Um, Got it. That, Got it. That Greg, doesn't can you... necessarily mean, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're working 24 seven either, right? Can you, can you then tell if you don't use uh, necessarily academic achievements, or you don't look at this necessarily at what they majored in. How do you tell a good engineer from a bad one? What, what do you think is the uh, defining factor? Uh, I mean, there's a, there's the initial resume screen, right? Um, and if I'm iffy on it, um, as much as I I don't like going through this experience myself, um, I'll pass people that try to join my team through a technical screen, um, whether that's a Q&A session or whether that's an actual exercise. And I'm careful to time box that. Um, I'm up front with my candidates that, you know, we're going to put you through a, a small technical test. We don't expect you to spend more than X number of hours on it because I myself have gone through more than 40 hours of interviewing to not find it, to, to basically be passed up for a job and that, that stung, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I am also upfront with the people who, who I'm hiring that there is no way to flunk the test unless you don't try. Um, and I've had people not try. Um, and, and so they, they, weren't, they weren't considered. But you know, even if you don't do well at it, um, if I have an opportunity for you to join as a junior level uh, you know, person on, on my DevOps team, then I will certainly bring you in and we can do what we can to mentor you and hopefully send you out of here a better DevOps person than you came in. Okay, got it. Yeah, I think cultural learning is an interesting concept. Does, does anybody have any comments on this? And especially Anthony, uh, Anthony Rogers, uh, because you mentioned that um, companies don't necessarily need an A-level engineer, that C-level engineers may suffice. Uh, can you elaborate on that? What, what do you think? Uh, yeah, uh, that so um, I'm an engineer, uh, lead in, former lead engineer for Fortune 20. And uh, um, the large majority of the people that I've worked with over the course of my career. Um, I, I ranked them at a five, about a two or a three. Um, so like in reality, like what HR is typically looking for in a candidate is like the sort of a unicorn developer. But in reality, what the team needs is a lot less. Um, they just need somebody that can you know, deliver on the work that the business and the product teams need. Um, so just like reevaluating what the actual needs are and what the products that need to be delivered are um, is, is huge. Um, I've also built a candidate uh, sourcing and screening platform. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty wide ranging in the scores that we get. Um, we'll have uh, guys with 15 years of experience perform worse than somebody that's that just came out of a boot camp. Um, so, uh, you know, relying on somebody's resume is is a pretty difficult measure. Um, I really more so when I'm hiring for my own team and through the platform, 
Um, I really focus on ability rather than background. Got it. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, years of experience is not necessarily a good measure because it, in a sense, let's say, discriminates against the people who learn faster. <laughs> so it's, uh, to put it like this, and uh, I, I totally agree that it's not necessarily uh, the, the best a way to assess to just look at you know the where somebody worked and, and, and for how long. Um, I, I think Abel had a question. Uh, what main factors would make a good recruiting experience? I think I can handle that because of the interviews I had with um, practitioners in this area. So here's what I thought. Here's the advice that I uh, heard. When you're hiring, make sure there is someone tasked with informing the candidate about the progress. So it could be. You know, someone at your company who at least sends an email or maybe calls up the candidate at least every week and tells them, you know, yes, we are working on your application. You're still, you know, in in the in the queue or whatever that is, um, so that the candidate doesn't think that he was forgotten. And I think that that respect that you know we remember about you, I think, is the number one thing. What I heard, for example, is stories where. Um, somebody was told, a candidate was told, we we're gonna make a decision by the end of the week. And when on Friday, there was no decision, on Saturday, that person applied elsewhere and got the job elsewhere. But what the, the company, they thought they could get, get back to him on Monday. So they got back to him on Monday, but on Monday, he said, oh no, I already, I already accepted the job elsewhere. So in a sense, the, the time factor is really important. And so when you promise you get to someone by the end of the week, really do that, or at least follow up. I think it's the, the punctuality. Uh, that's probably the number one thing. And other than that, it's, I would say, um, the, the things I heard, uh, and I kind of mentioned it previously, is uh, the interview process. So in the interview process, you get the same questions over and over again. That's, that's weird. Like different, different, can, different interviewers shouldn't be asking the same questions. Second, if you are asking them to do something that is kind of out of touch with what they're going to be doing on the on a daily basis. So like the example was writing code in a piece of paper as part of the test that can repel someone because that's not how engineers work nowadays. They, they use Google, they use resources and that's normal. So uh, if, you're, if you want to do a coding test, one way of doing this is to have them, give them access to those resources. And, and test their ability to work in that environment simulates their actual work environment. Um, another thing would be questions about syntactic details in a language where nowadays with you know, Google and, and, and tools like this, you don't really have to remember that. That's not necessarily the number one thing. Um, so, so I would say that would, be, that would be the factors that I heard about, but I, definitely the number one is, um, is, is, is the time factor, respecting the time. Of the candidates that's that's what uh because the best ones they get a lot of offers and the thing is you don't want to be put in a situation where you choose you have to choose among the candidates that have left the, the candidates that haven't said no <laughs> to and they haven't gone elsewhere you, you, you and and the, these the best ones they they basically have a lot of offers to choose from um but yeah and another one uh, rice is writing uh, providing feedback to the candidate i actually heard that a lot as well, and uh, thanks for reminding me this. One of the recruiters said that if you provide the feedback to the candidate that is useful, for example, you tell them, you know what? Yes, we like your coding skills, but you know what? Our, your English, for example, is not that good yet, especially if you're hiring someone you know, outside um, English speaking countries. Uh, if you brush up on your English, you can you know, apply another six months and maybe you know, we, we, we can, we have to, you know, we have to we communicate with English speaking clients, we have to hire you. Uh, we have to, we have, no, you have to know that before we hire you. So, so if you get specific feedback, if you give them specific feedback, that will definitely be uh, huge. Um, uh, Greg writes, when a candidate passes on an opportunity, um, uh, mouse cars, opportunity we advertise, I often ask how we could have done better interviewing them. Oh, that's great. I love that. Um, um, Michael. Uh, Michael, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and, and say you, you're, uh, you're saying you agree with Greg, better to reach out directly. Uh, would you like to join in? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm um, from uh, a place in Peterborough in England, uh, near Cambridge. Um, and for me, I suppose it depends on the type of role. Um, so I mentioned earlier on that actually, for example, I'm looking um, to recruit a tech lead. 
And it would be great if this person had great skills in coding, came from a software engineering environment. But actually, it's the soft skills that are the most important for this role. And you can't assess that by looking at a resume. You have to speak to that person and find out what are their motivations, how do they motivate their team? How do they make their team see the, their bigger impact, their value? Um, so it's not necessarily about did they graduate from university? Do they have great technical coding skills? But actually, it's about those soft skills. And I really believe that's something that cannot be taught. I believe you either have it or you don't. And I think that's why some, some roles like a technical lead are extremely hard to fill, maybe in comparison to a software engineer, because they're kind of hybrid. They have to have the technical knowledge, but they need to also be, and I hate to say it, but a people person. <laughs> so it, for me, the challenge is that it does depend on the type of the role. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying, Michael. Let me just uh, argue a little bit with that. Uh, I, what I wanted to say is that I used to be a very, let's say, uh, let's say a techie that was kind of closed in a shell. And it took me years to get out of that shell and became more of a people person, as you said. I think it's something that maybe it can be taught, but it's something that can, can develop. And maybe it's something that mm -hmm someone can bring out of themselves over time, you know, with maturity, but also with, in a sense, uh, I would say getting positive experiences in interactions with people and getting more confident with them. So I think it's something that, that can be uh, practiced definitely. Uh, so um, I definitely made a lot of progress in there, but, but thanks for that. Um, and just just yeah, to add on to on. that, um, the, the war for talent is, it's crazy right now. Um, try and look for the perfect candidate in every way. Uh, you know, you're going to be competing with other companies, even on the, the global scale for that talent. So, um, you know, maybe sometimes you just need to train people and, um, you know, bring them on board, even though you know that they lack in an area and just develop their experience. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's something interesting. Then, um, Anthony, do you have any ideas then? So if you're hiring someone, that is, so to say, let's call it a diamond that can be turned into a brilliant. So maybe someone who isn't yet, um, doesn't yet know the technologies, but uh, has the potential to learn. Do you think that you can somehow tell that this person has that potential, even if they don't know it yet? How would you tell that this someone is capable of learning something? I'm really like, uh, there's times where I just don't hire for technical ability. I hire for culture fit as well. Um, it really depends on the role um, because I can train somebody, you know, any day to, to teach them how to become a good programmer. It's really about the attitude and um, how well they work with the team. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. How do you test that? Like, how do you test if someone uh, will work well with the team? How do you assess the soft skills? And that's also a question um, for you, Michael. Do you, have, do you have any specific advice? How would you test for that? When I'm, when I'm interviewing somebody and I'm having them work through a problem set, uh, I, I pretty much go and ask them as they're working through it. Um, I, I tell them, hey, is there a better way for you to be doing X, Y, Z? Or uh, I ask them like difficult questions and... Uh, I've actually had people walk out of interviews when that happens. Um, people get very sort of protected or egotistical about their work and their approaches. Um, uh, this has happened in about 20% of interviews that I've given. Interesting. So, uh, so you're looking for defensiveness. If somebody gets too defensive, that's basically, it's a, it's a red flag. Did I understand it correctly? Exactly. Got it. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Michael, how about you? So when you talked about the soft skills, so how, how do you test for, for those soft skills? That's a really great question. For me, really, it's about how they approach their stakeholders. It's going to be a massive element of the role. So a lot of the stakeholders actually aren't technically minded. So one of the first questions that I ask is, you're a technical genius or expert, if you like. How how would you go about speaking to somebody and gathering requirements from them who aren't technically savvy or how are you able to influence that person? So how do they relay that information without all of the technical jargon? And I suppose going back to the leadership skills as well as 
like I mentioned, how are they going to motivate their team? If their team are really snowed under, really stressed, it's really high pressure, how are they going to continue that momentum and how are they going to make each, each individual feel as though they are making a mass contribution? Mm, got it. I, I like to put those questions across. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and I, so definitely, you know, communicating with stakeholders. I'm going to change the view to gallery uh, for a moment uh, because I'd like to bring some more people into the discussion. Uh, Magdi, because you did you did uh, comment on the chat a little bit. Do you have do you have some thoughts to share? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> it's okay to say if you you know you just want to uh, listen. But uh, do you have any thoughts uh, that you'd like to share? Yeah, uh, actually, I've been working with uh, a lot of teams recently, and I found out that people love to bring the new technologies and. Uh, new skills that they, they have learned and they don't want to leave it uh, what they what where they were you know they want to use it so when they want to work on a new project uh, uh, so if if you say oh it's not allowed here we, we don't use this tech here and uh, you know working at edge technology sometimes uh, looks like this but it's okay to let them bring what they have and adapt what they learned with the team that currently is working. So this is this might be a better approach to attract them. Interesting. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good yeah. yeah, getting, getting in touch. With Just you. in the way of that, um, there's like some factors that go into it, like maintainability, like who's going to be there to maintain that, that functionality. Um, before I left my last company, I implemented what's called Prisma. But after I left, um, uh, you know, nobody on the team understood how to use it. Uh, so, you know, there, there just needs to be somebody to, with as much knowledge to maintain that functionality. Right, got it. AP, I, I saw you were raising your hand. Uh, why don't you unmute yourself and go on? Perfect. Thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me well. So I'd like to bring in a different aspect here as it relates to soft, soft skills and recruiting in general. And that's the oftentimes organizations are hiring for a past title instead of the aptitude to do the job. And a perfect example is um, I'm seeking leadership opportunities specifically, but yet all of my past titles are senior analyst or analyst, call center supervisor, things of that nature. So companies are looking specifically for someone that has senior manager or director or VP title, but yet they're not asking those candidates to quantify what type of successes they've had when people in non-management roles have had more success in leadership and have actually pioneered a lot of efforts. So I think that's one change that needs to happen in order to really identify those, not just soft skills, universal skills, team building skills, innovative skills, because oftentimes it's not the management team that's behind these great ideas, or it's not the management team that's behind the leadership and the cohesiveness of a team. It's actually the team itself. So therefore, those people are constantly not given the opportunity to showcase, you know, their ability to do so because they haven't had the title. They've just been doing the work and the job without it. That's that's interesting. Yes, uh, there could be something. A lot of a lot of things hidden, uh, even without a title. Uh, a lot of leadership experience, and I think that's 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 very true. And I'm just uh, uh, just thinking. A lot of presidents actually and politicians uh, did not have formal executive experience, which is interesting. Uh, Shankar, you had um, uh, you had you commented on the chat as well. Uh, would you like to uh, contribute uh, uh, on, on the stage? Yeah, I mean, thank you very much, by the way, the very interesting session so far. I think like some of these, uh, some of what I'm able to bring up, or what I'm able to, about to bring up, I think has already been covered. But one aspect I find is like motivation levels are, I mean, it's kind of related to attitude, but motivation levels of candidates. So uh, ability is one thing, but like I have often seen like in the past, like candidates with who have like awesome ability, but but aren't actually that motivated on the job. Now, some of it is obviously related to are they bought into the mission? Uh, are they a good fit with the, within kind of a culture, quote unquote? Um, but some of it also, I wonder if, if it can be like gauged during an interview. 
right? Whether this candidate is actually motivated, do they care about uh, delivering ownership, things like that, or uh, they're just looking for a job. Got it. So can you elaborate a bit more? So how, how, do, you, how do you find out what their motivation is? And if, if there's alignment there, uh, what, would you, what, what would you ask during the interview to, to find out if that alignment I, is there? I don't have a great answer. I'm looking for suggestions. Like I have, I have seen things like, for example, you can try to probe them and, and see how much they have thought about the mission or like something related to it, right? So that, that's, that's a concrete way to assess if somebody somebody cares about the mission or are or, or, or they kind of deeply uh, involved in, in this area. But, but that's only one aspect, right? So you could have, at least from my experience, engineers who may not per se care that much about the mission of the company, but they just love writing software or like they are passionate about like uh, kind of making sure that their software is robust or like they care about the general notion of like, hey, if I'm building something, I want to make sure that like, customers have good experience with it. They may not per se care about the mission, but like they care about other aspects of software development, right? So, so in that sense, I'm saying that just testing whether they they are bought into the mission covers one aspect, but it doesn't necessarily uh, prove one way or the other, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, so, so I'm just looking for how other people are doing this, right? Like how do you gauge if somebody is going to be motivated and 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 show up with a lot of energy or not? Yeah, I got it. Makes sense. So. Uh, Greg is asking, actually, so when you all say culture fit, what does it mean? And that's, that's an interesting uh, one, especially that, uh, by the way, I just recently was moderated a panel on cultural resilience and how culture um, can perpetuate itself. But in a sense, one of the conclusions was that cultures do change all the time because they adapt. They adapt to changing circumstances. So what does it mean that the culture is resilient? Uh, it, can, it has to adapt to the circumstances rather than being constant. Uh, so what does it mean that somebody fits into a culture? In a sense, we all create the culture of a company. Um, does anybody want to uh, take on the question that has some insights on that? What, what does it really I think, mean? I think that's exactly it, especially for the company that I work for. It's actually being diverse and inclusive. That's the culture that we live and breathe. So letting that person be their authentic self and actually adapt within that environment also as well like i mentioned in the chat it's about being collaborative and actually challenging the status quo so as, as part of as being authentic being able to bring your ideas and knowing that they're valued and challenging challenging processes that we might have had before how can we always be better how can we always be ahead of the game in front of our competitors that's the culture that i come from at compare the market yeah it it really depends too like um i've come from organizations where you know the workforce had all those attributes and they were innovative, but leadership wasn't receptive to that. They were against um, innovating and uh, uh, allowing individuals to step out of their, uh, their comfort zones. Uh, I was gonna chime in too, but I'm not sure if Anthony is pausing or um, if you're complete. Oh, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I loved what Michaela said in terms of inclusivity and diversity. And the reason being is as a woman in tech, that is specific to culture. So are you the only woman um, in tech, you know, in that department? If so, are you fighting an uphill battle each time when a decision needs to be made or when a project risk is identified or when you're needing additional budget for your project? Um, or is there actually an inclusive environment where everyone is treated equally, right? It's one of equality. So that's very important for culture. And then also collaboration. So I spoke earlier about how Oftentimes, management's the one receiving the recognition for the work done, right, um, in terms of title, in terms of compensation, in terms of um, even flexibility with job perks, things of that nature. So how does the culture recognize the work that's actually being done? Is there a strong recognition program? Um, is there an opportunity for the people wanting to seek the next opportunity to advance, right? And to actually get visibility with the hiring um, executives for the next level? Or is it more of a, 
of a, you know, everyone hush, hush, right? Don't, don't share what you've done. Don't, you know, don't speak up. Don't use your voice. So that's what I look for um, when we use the term culture fit is, you know, can I actually use my voice for good? Will I be allowed to influence decisions in a, that make a positive impact? And will I be mistreated because I'm a woman in tech or because I'm Hispanic or um, because I'm an immigrant or because I'm a single mom? And it, it's sad to say, you know, that, that those are things that have that do occur, right? There's um, microaggressions that occur in the workplace. So that's just, um, that's what I look for in culture. I think what you're describing, AP, is not so much culture fit as it, I would call just culture. I think that's a specific type of culture that you uh, are striving to have, which is really good. Uh, but I think uh, in a general sense, um, culture fit usually talks about how a specific person fits into your culture. So that would be a person who has all of those um, values that you talked about already pre-existing before they come into to your process. Yeah, it, it was more so um, like some companies need to also look at themselves um, to, you know, ensure that they, they do strive to have these qualities internally um, in order to attract the best candidates. Um, some of these are essentials. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I think it's, it's covered a lot of interesting stuff. And uh, it, uh, we talked a lot about soft skills and the cultural fit and uh, motivational fit and, and so on. 